All right, so our first speaker today is going to be Crystal Hill, and she's going to be talking to us about dietary protein restriction and metabolic adaptation. So good evening, everyone. First, I want to thank the organizers for asking me to um, join the session. Um, it's very interesting to me about these, uh, I like to phrase them as anti-aging diets and how they benefit metabolic health or just health span and how that relates to extending lifespan. So um, for about five years now, I have been studying dietary protein restriction in the laboratory of Chris Morrison at Pennington Biomedical Research Center in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And so, like I said, uh, there's a, a host of dietary interventions that we are all aware about. Uh, classical calorie restriction, which is the gold standard for or related to uh, improving metabolic health as well as the lifespan. But calorie restriction is very hard. I think we all can attest to that, that who wants to not eat certain amounts of food <laughs> when there's a lot of food to have or consume. But uh, what are these other diets that could, you know, benefit health when we don't have to count calories? So fasting is one of them. And I won't go through this whole chart here. It's just to give an introduction kind of where I'm going with this ketogenic diets, as well as reducing the dietary protein. Or so you can restrict total protein or you can um, alter methionine as well as BCAA restriction. But the point of this figure here is that, we have a laser here? Okay. Yes, yes, is that all of these diets have a benefit on health span, right? So I said that before, but just to know that that's the take home message of this um, chart, you don't have to try to read this whole thing. So I tried to make this more relatable, how we could understand how are we actually consuming protein. So what I did was I went to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and I took the general recommendation for a person that weighs about 165 pounds. And they said they should consume about optimal 60 grams of protein, right, daily. So we also can categorize um, protein intake by it being in excess. So there are some clinical symptoms that occur with um, dietary protein or overconsumption of um, protein intake. So you have dehydration, gastric function, meaning like constipation. You may see an increase in weight gain, see tooth and bone damage, uh, urea levels within the blood, increase of risk of um, kidney dysfunction, cancer, type 2 diabetes, as well as cardiovascular disease. Or, on the other end, we have protein deficiency. So there's a malnourishment here with weight loss, fatigue, weakness, reduced muscle tone, fluid retention, as well as a pH imbalance, and these are just some of the clinical symptoms that you see when um, there's not enough of the protein consumption. Slow wound healing, low libido, being irritable, confusion, brain fog, thin hair, and weak nails. So we know this gets into a, a, a place of um, where we see uh, a, a decline in, in health. So what do we think about protein restriction? There's really a reduction all the way down to one fourth of the total intake. And so Chris and I, my um, advisor um, at Pennington, likes to see it as it's still healthy, but we are treading this fine line right before there's this malnourishment. But if you restrict protein, restrict if you restrict protein intake, you have improved kidney function, that's been shown. You reduce the risk for diabetes, cancer, and cardiovascular disease. You see a shift in metabolic flexibility. We've um, seen increase in energy expenditure. In particular, within our lab, we see that there's a, a, a direct requirement and an increase in FGF21 levels. Okay, so now we're going to 
So I won't go, I won't spend too much time on this slide, but we all are aware there are um, essential amino acids that you have to uh, consume from dietary um, products or from food, which your body cannot make these. Then you have the non-essentials that make, um, that use the essential amino acids to make these uh, amino acids within the body. And so just briefly, I think we all uh, are familiar with this slide from the Longo's lab that if you reduce protein or amino acid within yeast and flies, you have um, beneficial effects on uh, metabolic measures as well as activation of stress resistance genes and these favorably um, impact lifespan. It's also been shown to be true within humans as well as in rodents and that you restrict protein or reduce fat here in the case they have here. Um, you have an increase in longevity as well as a reduction in the risk for CVD as well as diabetes and cancer. And so within the Morrison's lab, I'm just going to give you a little background data about what we have, or Chris has been studying for about a decade now. Is, is there a signal that uh, responds to protein restriction or when there's a reduced amount of amino acids within the body, is there a hormonal uh, signal for this? So another way I can kind of put this into a perspective is think about animals in the wild. So animals have to sense their need for protein restriction. The best one I like to use is this hummingbird here. We mostly see hummingbirds at kind of consume something sweet or nectar, but at times they have to consume protein. So if you see them like just flying around in air, they're actually consuming nets or bugs. And you can also think of this as a bear. A bear is normally what you think for them to graze. But at times they have to fish, they go and hunt for protein. Why would they want to work this hard when they can just graze on berries and go like that? So could there be a molecular signal that makes the body respond to protein restriction? So this paper was published in um, 2016, and this was one of the first papers to show that FGL21 is an endocrine signal of protein restriction. So here we use a diet of controlled protein, which is about 20%, and low protein diet, which is about 5%. You take the low protein diet and feed it to an animal for four days, you see a robust increase in FGL21 levels. Out to day 14 is consistent, but you do not see any changes in control or normal fed animals. Also, in protein restricted animals, you see a reduction in body weight gain, yet you see increases in food intake. But you also see an increase in um, energy expenditure. But those changes are blunted in animals that are um, deficient of FGF21. We also see increases in UCP1 um, when animals are um, protein restricted. And we also see changes in the uh, IY or the inguinal white adipose tissue of these multilocular uh, cell phenotype or pheno adipose tissue phenotype, which somehow resembles uh, association to browning of the white adipose tissue. And those changes are uh, blunted within the FGL2 as well. So um, the FGL2 is an hormone mostly secreted for the liver. And once it's secreted within the circulation, it can bind to or be attracted to uh, other tissues, which has beneficial effects on um, metabolic health. It improves glucose uptake, as well as energy expenditure. We've seen reductions in body weight gain, and it also decreases the GH response to target tissue. So it works through this core receptor called beta corto. And this just transmits a, a full um, signal that's on the cell. And so in humans, um, there was a study back at Pennington that was known as the proof study. So I'm going to give you just a little gist of how this study was designed. It was male and female um, subjects were placed on a weight stabilization um, diet, and they fed them three different types of diets, one being 5%, um, which is low protein, 15%, which is controlled protein, and 25% protein for 56 days. These um, subjects were also um, overfed um, 
40% increase in their energy intake in all groups. And as you can see here, when they look at FGL 21 levels, even during overfeeding, low protein, um, low protein um, individuals, fed individuals had an increase in FGL 21 levels. And you also have a calorie bank at Huntington. And what they're showing here is that um, not even energy restriction increases FGL 21 levels. So FGL 21 is a signal, signal of protein restriction. So this paper just came out. So we always um, have this question, but if I only eat veggies, will I restrict the quantity or the quality of the amino acid intake? And I was pretty, pretty happy to see this paper uh, recently released from Jay Mitchell's uh, lab. And so what they're showing here, and this is just from the abstract of the paper, which you can, uh, you can see, read it on cell metabolism, release of cell metabolism, that Meat protein, of course, has more total grams of amino acids compared to vegetable protein. Here they have peas. But when you compare the amino acid uh, ratio, the percent of total protein between the two, there's no difference. And so we can talk more about that. And that's why I want to leave you here with this last slide about various sources of protein content and how we can consume those and how we may be able to restrict those and not to the level of malnourishment, but to the level that we see the beneficial um, health outcome. So I just want to um, give my acknowledgments. Of, I'm happy to see Dr. Barkey here today. I did my graduate work in his lab and then I moved on to uh, Pennington. And so I would just say uh, for me, aging is one of my first loves and interests in research. I didn't know about aging or gerontology research as an undergraduate. And so I'm sticking with it and going to Pennington with Chris Morrison, who is not a traditional aging researcher, but a neuro um, endocrine uh, researcher. So I was able to fuse two types or two interests of mine together to keep moving on. So with that, I'm done.